Uh, hello and welcome to lecture nine for uh, the course ECE 252B Computer Arithmetic, uh, Spring 2020. This lecture deals with chapter 11 in the textbook entitled Tree and Array Multipliers. Now in the Previous two chapters on multiplications, we dealt with basic multipliers. And then in chapter 10, we discussed high radix multipliers that are basically uh, speeded up versions uh, of basic multipliers where mo several bits of the multiplier is handled per cycle, and therefore we need fewer cycles. And then we also saw how keeping the partial product in carry safe form can reduce the length of each cycle. So we reduce the number of cycles by using high radix and reduce the length of each cycle by using carry safe partial product. So in this chapter, we deal with uh, basically combinational multipliers, more or less. There, there are a few exceptions. Uh, by combinational, I mean we design the circuits so that we input the operands on one side and signals flow through the circuit and uh, out comes the output from the other side without any iteration. So it's just one pass through the hardware and therefore they can be extremely fast. But they can also be quite complex in terms of the amount of hardware that they need. Okay, so let's get started. <clears throat> By looking at this diagram that I showed you earlier, uh, a full tree multiplier is on the right side. There is a carry save adder tree that processes uh, the partial products, basically adds them up, and represents the result as a carry save number or some other redundant form. And then those carry save numbers are added, so the, the two components of the carry save number are added in a regular adder. So this is the combinational circuit. There's some latency associated with this uh, CSA tree, and some latency associated with the adder, but there's no iteration. It's just one pass through this hardware to get the full product at the bottom. So this is the uh, tree multiplier in a bit more detail. Um, not only I've shown the carry save adder tree, in the middle, I've shown the two other components, the multiple forming circuits. So before we can add things together, we have to form those partial products. And for example, if we take one bit of the multiplier and multiply it by A, we can get a partial product. So in that case, we will have K partial product. If we do radix 4 at this stage, then we take two bits of the multiplier and multiply them by A, in which case we will have K over two partial products, okay? So the multiple forming circuits is one part of this multiplier. Then the tree, which reduces uh, those K or K over two or whatever number of operands we have there to a carry save number or some other redundant form. And finally, a circuit that converts that redundant representation into standard non-redundant form, say binary. Or this can be a decimal multiplier, in which case the output will be decimal. Now, as the tree processes um, all these partial products, some of the bits of the final product drop out 
and need no further processing. They're, they're routed directly to the output. And then the rest of the operand goes through additional levels in the tree until it emerges here. So by the time we get down here at the bottom of this tree, typically we have already produced a few bits of the final product that are basically in their final forms and uh, they don't need to be processed further, so they drop out. So this is a full tree multiplier on the left. The tree of carry save adders has logarithmic depth in terms of the width k of the operand. And the adder also has logarithmic depth. And therefore, the entire multiplier has logarithmic latency. So this is the fastest multiplier that we can design. But there will be a lot of hardware in this large tree of carry save adders. Alternatively, if this is too complex, then we can use a smaller tree that processes a subset of the partial products. Let's say if we have 64 here, and this tree is just too expensive for what we are trying to do. We may decide to process maybe 16 of the partial product in one pass through the tree. We get the carry save partial product, feed it back, and combine that with the next batch of 16, again with a third batch of 16, and again with a fourth batch of 16. So we use four passes to, through this tree to accumulate all the 64 partial products, 16 at a time. Okay, So this basically will be slower because we'll have iteration. But it will also be cheaper, less complex, because this tree has 18 inputs, 16 of the partial products and the two operands that are fed, fed back 18 instead of 64. Okay. So designs of these tree multipliers are distinguished, as I said, by the three components. And each of these components has variations. Multiple forming circuits. We can form the multiples in different ways. The partial products reduction tree, and again, this tree can be designed in different ways. And finally, redundant to binary converter, and there are options here that we can use. And therefore, we can get uh, many different designs depending on the choices we make for each of the three parts. And these different designs will have different latencies, different costs, different energy consumption. So they offer trade-offs to the designer. So let's start with a very simple example, a 4x4 multiplier, and look at two of the options for the reduction tree, Wallace tree reduction and data tree reduction. And we have seen this before in connection with multiple operand addition. <clears throat> So here, the partial product matrix has one dot in this column, two, three, four, and then three, two, one. And this is what's represented here. The number of dots in each column goes from one to two to three to four, and then down to three to one, according to what you see here. Now in Wallace tree, strategy or reduction, we combine things as early as possible so that in a column where we have just one dot, we do nothing. That dot is already in its final form, so we don't do anything. In the column where we have two dots, we apply a half adder that generates um, a sum bit and a carry bit. Here we apply a full adder that generates a sum bit and a carry bit, but there's also a carry bit coming from here, so that's why we have two dots, and so on. 
So three full adders and one half adder lead to this arrangement of dots. Again, two columns are now already in their final form. So we start here, apply a half adder, sum bit plus carry bit, apply a full adder here, and so on. So here I have two half adders and two full adders. And then at this point, the height of the matrix becomes two, and that's when I apply a regular adder the 4-bit adder in this case, which gives me the 4-bit sum and the carryout. Okay, so here I use the 1, 2, 3 half adders, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 full adders, 3 half adders and 5 full adders, and a 4-bit adder. And the latency will be two levels of full adders, plus the latency of the 4-bit data. On the right, you see the data tree strategy. Now, if you recall, data uh, advocates that we do not reduce things as early as possible, but postpone reductions as much as possible without increasing the latency. So if the height of the matrix is 4, as it is the case here, my goal is to reduce the height to 3, which is the next number in that magic sequence. Remember, 6, 4, 3, 2. So my first objective is to reduce the height to 3. Therefore, I apply a full adder here. A half adder, sorry. Because I, just, I need to reduce the number of dots by just 1. And a half adder does that. It takes two dots and produces the sum bit and a carry bit. Here I have three dots, but because a carry will be coming in from this position, I also apply a half adder here. And this is now my matrix, having used two half adders. And now in this uh, part of the diagram, the red elements are the ones that constitute corrections compared to what you see in the textbook. Okay, now after the second level of reduction, so what, did, <coughs> excuse me, what did I use? Three half adders and three full adders versus three half adders and five full adders here. So I, use fewer hardware elements in these levels. On the other hand, my final adder is 6 bits wide instead of 4 bits wide. Now, Dada was motivated in his strategy by the fact that this adder being 6 bits or 4 bits usually does not make much difference in its speed because we usually use an adder that is already available to us. So if you're using a CPU, uh, you know, arithmetic logic unit of a CPU, we have an adder in there for because we do additions, okay? So the same adder is typically used in the multiplication process. We don't have a separate adder for this. Therefore, if that adder is, let's say, 64 bits wide, now making this final addition, let's say, 40 bits wide, so 64 does not help us because we are not going to design a special adder for this. We use that white adder that is already available to us. And therefore, the width of this final adder in that with those assumptions that we are using an already existing adder in the design does not in increase the complexity or increase the latency. Therefore, I've saved some hardware early on without increasing the latency of the design. So these are examples of the alternative reduction tree. Okay? We can have a wallet tree or we can have a data tree. These are just two examples. So here is a carry save adder tree shown in more detail. So here, 
This corresponds to a 7-bit by 7-bit multiplier. So the partial products go from position 0 to 6. Let's see. Uh, positions 0 to 6 for the first partial product. 1 to 7, shifted to the left by 1 bit. 2 to 8, 3 to 9, 4 to 10, 5 to 11, 6 to 12. So these are the seven partial products with different shifts that need to be added together. When we have such numbers with varying amounts of shifts and therefore dots in different bit positions, we combine the ones that are closest to each other. So we don't combine the 0, 6 with the 6, 12 because they don't have much overlap with each other. So we combine 0, 6, 1, 7, and 2, 8 into a carry save adder. And then I'll show the details of this one carry save adder. The reason I'm saying that this is a 7-bit CSA is shown here. Okay, so the 0, 6, 0 to 6 operand, bit 0 drops out because that's the only place where we have bit 0. So that's basically directed to the output. And then the remaining part of that goes from position 1 to position 6. So 1 to 6 is one of the operands. 1 to 6, that's the top. 1 to 7 is another one of the operands. And then 2 to 8 is the third operand. So here I need a half adder. Full, 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 full. Another half adder. And nothing here because that's one dot and then one carry comes here. So I'm okay in that position. So this is a seven bit carry save adder. Similarly, for these three numbers, I need a seven bit carry save adder. Okay, then I take The sum bit, the sum bits, and the carry bits out of this carry save adder, and combine them with this leftover number. I need a seven bit carry save adder. Again, you can supply the details why this is a seven bit CSA by doing a dot notation diagram like that for the three inputs that it receives. Then we take these two, 1 to 8, 2 to 8, and this output, 3 to 12. Oh, sorry, the 1 to 8 uh, bit position 1, that's the only thing that is left in that bit position. So we sort of retire that, send it to the output, and the remainder will be 2 to 8. So I have 2 to 8, 2 to 8, and then 3 to 12. and so on and so forth. You see that the width of these carry save adders does not grow as we expected because we expect them to grow wider and wider as we go down. But that's not the general rule because you see right here that I have in the next level a 10-bit carry save adder. And finally, this 10-bit carry save adder produces some bits in positions 3 to 12, carry bits in positions 4 to 13, and then that bit position 3 is sent to the output. The remainder is 4 to 12. These two numbers are added using a 10-bit carry propagate adder, which gives you the sum bit and the carry out. But the carry out in this example can be just dropped, can be ignored. Because when you multiply two 7-bit numbers, 
the product is 14 bits wide. We already have 14 bits over here. Therefore, this carry out is bound to be zero because the product of two seven bit numbers is always representable in 14 bits. Now, carry save adder trees tend to be quite irregular, irregular as you see in this diagram. And this creates some difficulty in BLSI realization. In BLSI, we prefer things to be regular so that we lay out a part of the design, a slice of the design, so to speak, and then replicate it as many times as needed to get the full design. Here, this irregularity, the way the CSS are, CSAs are organized and the way they are connected to each other is quite irregular. Therefore, we are motivated to examine other methods of partial product re reduction that lead to more regular layouts. So here's one example. This is known as a balanced delay tree for 11 inputs. The 11 inputs come in from the top. So here are the 11 inputs at the very top. And then, so this is one slice of the design. So 11 dots in one column come in. And then we do 3 to 2 reduction, 3 to 2 reduction, and so on. Until at the end, we get just two bits, a sum and a carry out, which goes basically to the next higher position. So this is basically an 11-2 counter. 11 inputs coming in in the same column. And two outputs go in the same column and in the next higher column. You remember from our discussion of N2 counters, such counters require carries between various uh, slices because 11 numbers can add, 11 bits can add to up to 11. And these two bits can represent at most three. One plus two is three. So the rest of the value needs to be transferred to subsequent columns. So you see here that you have eight carries coming in and eight carries going on, going out. So using the terminology of our N2 counter implementation, we have psi one, the number of carries going from one slice to the next higher slice, must satisfy this equation. 11 inputs plus the carries coming in should be representable in the carries that go out, each of which is worth two units, plus the three, the value three that we can represent at the outputs at the bottom of the diagram. Okay, this equation leads to psi one equal to eight, and we have eight carries therefore. Now, there are some properties of this uh, design worth noting. First of all, we try to make the signals go through the same number of logic levels to the extent possible. If you look at this carry save adder tree, because of that irregularity, that there are different paths that we have that are varying length. So for example, if I trace this path starting at the top at the 3.9 input, goes through one carry save adder, two carry save adder, three carry save adders, four carry save adders before arriving at. Whereas there is a faster path here from the 612 input, one carry save adder, one carry save adder, and then two carry save adders. So this uh, lack of balance in the delays of different paths, and besides, you know, when you lay out, these wires will be of different lengths and therefore the difference in latencies will be amplified if the wires have different lengths. And that causes uh, glitching and therefore uh, loss of uh, energy. 
Okay, on the other hand, the balance delay tree tries to basically have all signals go through the same number of logic levels. So starting from the top, we have five full adder levels. Okay, level one has three full adders, level two, level three, level four, level five. And most of the signals go through all five levels. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. There are some exceptions. This signal, for example, skips one level. This one skips one level. This one skips two levels. But we can easily balance the delays on those paths by introducing delays. So for example, depending on how, what the latency of a full adder is, maybe we can put a couple of inverters here to introduce this artificial delay to balance the delays of the signal. And if we properly balance the delays, glitching will be minimized and therefore the design will be will require less power. Okay, so that's one aspect. The second aspect is that you see carries generated by one slice going to the next one, and then the next one also in turn generates carries. If you're not careful, these carries can propagate and therefore reduce the speed of this design due to carry propagation. So the way that is uh, prevented is that carries are divided into levels. So carries that are generated by the level one full adders, there are three of them. This one, this one, and this one. When they go to the next level, the next slice, they enter level two full adders. We don't let them go up there because that would lead to long carry propagation chain. So the, the, these carries have already experienced one full adder delay and then in the next slice, they will go to full, full adder level two, and therefore they experience one less full adder delay from that point on. So therefore, one full adder, then they go here, two, three, four, five. So everything, every signal experiences a maximum of five full adder delays, including signals that are internal to the slice, and signals that come as carries from other slices. Level two carries generated by these full adders enter the next slice and go into level three full adders. Okay? And this way, five full adder levels is the latency, maximum latency that a signal experiences. And with provision of sufficient delays on these signals that skip levels, everything basically will have roughly the same latency from input to output. Okay, that's why these are called balanced delay trees. There's another aspect of this that needs to be discussed. Now, if I implement the slice in VLSI and just replicate it 16 times, I will get a 16 slice 11 to 2 counter. In other words, reduce 16 operands to 2 operands using 16 copies of this circuit. But the way I've laid it out here, that's inconvenient for replication. So the way we usually lay them out is we put these nine full adders in a column and then route the various signals to them appropriately. So the 11 signals that come in, the input, three of them may go there. Three of them will be routed to this full adder. Three more will be routed to this full adder. And the two that are left over will be routed further down, okay? So there will be channels for wires going down here to take the inputs to the appropriate full adders. And then there will be level one carries produced by these three full adders. And those must go to full adders in level two. 
so those coming in will be routed to the appropriate so basically I designed this narrow circuit with all the wire connections required to bring the inputs to the full adders and the carries to the full adders and generate the carries and then I replicate this vertical slice as many times as needed to get an 11-2 reduction circuit. Okay, so the layout task is just to lay out one of these slices and then replicate it as many times as needed. So here is the designation of level 1 full adders, level 2 full adders, level 3, level 4, level 5. So level 4 carry must go to level 5. Therefore, level 4 carries will come through here and will be connected, let's say, to this. Level 3 carries should go to level 4. So level 3 carries, the two of them will come here and will be connected to these two lines and so on. Okay, now one of the reasons that the carry save adder trees are irregulars, irregular is that they correspond to a 3-2 reduction circuit. And 3-2 reduction of 1.5, factor of 1.5 is sort of inconvenient. If we can design a 4 to 2 reduction circuit, then the tree of our multiplier will be basically a binary tree, which is much more regular. It's recursive and more, uh, it's easier to lay out. We know how to lay out binary trees in VLSI. Okay, a 4 to 2 reduction circuit can be two full adders, as shown here in the middle diagram. Or we can design a custom 4 to 2 compressor, a 4 to 2 counter, as shown here. Logically, the two are the same. The 4 to 2 compressor has the advantage that its critical path goes through three XOR gates. And or uh, two XOR gates and one multiplexer. Okay. Sorry, I keep losing my pointer. Okay, here it is. Two XOR gates and a multiplexer. Or one XOR gate, one multiplexer to generate this carry, but then that carry goes to the next slice and goes through another XOR or another multiplexer. So if a multiplexer latency is the same as XOR gate, which is a reasonable assumption, this has three XOR gate delays, whereas this other design with two full adders has four XOR gate delays two XOR gate delays for the sum bit and this full adder and another two for this sum bit. So this is a 4-2 compressor, 4-2 reduction circuit is a more reasonable building block to use in building these 4-2 binary trees. So here's an example of an actual multiplier that uses that binary tree reduction. I will skip the details of this. Uh, it comes from one of the references at the end of the chapter, and the reference is cited in the book if you are interested. So I just focus on the binary tree reduction for this. So basically, the yellow boxes receive four inputs and generate two outputs. So these two yellow boxes, so those two and these two go to a blue box, which receives two plus two, four inputs and generates two outputs. And then the other blue box down here provides two. So this is another 42 reduction. So we have 16, 
16 partial products reduced by this binary. Notice that the regular layout of the binary tree. In fact, this happens to be a 32-bit multiplier. And the reason we start with 16 operands is that 2 bits, so it's basically a radix 4. It starts with radix 4 multiplication. There are some other details here. For example, it doesn't use carry save numbers. It uses a, a binary sign digit intermediate values. But that, that's a minor detail. So the reason we start with 16 operands is that two bits of the multiplier are processed at once. And then those 16 operands are reduced to uh, 8 by a 42 reduction. The 8 are reduced to 4 by another set of 42 reduction. And finally, the 4 are reduced to 2 by this final orange block and those two values go into this green box and uh, are converted to standard binary from redundant form to standard binary okay the next uh, topic is tree multipliers for sign numbers if you look at the dot notation for multiplication, you have these partial products um, that are shifted with respect to one another, one another. And then there are two blank regions in the matrix, one to the left and one to the right because of these shifting. Now, if we do unsigned multiplication, those blank regions basically contain zeros. And therefore, we do not need to uh, worry about them in reducing the partial product. Okay, they won't affect the summation process. They're all zeros. However, if we have uh, uh, signed numbers, then so imagine this this representation here, where the x's are magnitude bits, and then alpha, beta, and gamma are sine bits. So these partial products are themselves two complement numbers. And if the sign bit is 1, we need to sign extend. And because we don't know whether it's going to be 1 or 0, we have to sign extend anyway. So whatever alpha is, 0 or 1, we extend it all the way to the end so that when we add these numbers, we get the correct sum. OK, this is rather inconvenient because now I have to provide hardware in handling these additional bits that are potentially non-zero. OK, one way to get rid of most of that hardware is to observe that, OK, in this column, I have one sign bit and two magnitude bits. And these two magnitude bits, of course, are not under my control. Here I have two sine bits and a magnitude bit. Beginning with this position, I have three sine bits. So these columns contain exactly the same set of bits. So alpha, sorry, this one, alpha, beta, gamma repeats. Those are the sine extension columns. So instead of putting full adders to reduce each of these columns, I can use just full one full adder to reduce this column into a sum and a carry, and then use the output of that full adder instead of using additional full adders. These positions, if I put full adders, they would produce exactly the same outputs. So if this fan out is not a problem, I can save on the use of those full adders. And therefore, the size of this carry save tree is uh, expanded a little bit because, see, I have three columns here that I need to handle. Whereas originally, basically, in this column, I had only two bits. and this column, I had one bit. But I have three bits there and this column as well. So 
The carry save address will be a little bit wider, but not quite as bad as if I had to extend those all the way to the end. So if this is, let's say, 16 bits, the sign extension part of it will be 16 bits. So there will be a significant amount of hardware here. OK. However, we have a more elegant method to deal, to avoid this sign extension than this. So this is conceptually what is happening. I do sign extension, but then I share the hardware that handles this extension part in this column, which has the three sign bits for these three rows. I share that for all the other columns, and all the other columns. OK, so what is the simpler method that I mentioned we have, the more elegant method? Now, this more elegant method basically adds very little to the hardware complexity. So in this diagram, you see four panels, A, B, C, D. A is basically unsigned multiplication, as we have done before, of two five-bit numbers. So we basically multiply bits by each other, form the partial product, and then we add them together. Okay, all those bits, and we have zeros in these blank areas, in these blank areas, because the numbers are unsigned. If we have two complement numbers, then remember that A4 and X4 are negatively weighted. And therefore, in this bit position, I have a negatively weighted A4 multiplied by the positive X0, a4 by x1, a4 by x2, a4 by x3, a4 by x4, both of them are negative, so this term is positive. Similarly, for x4 multiplied by a0, by a1, by a2, by a3. So those are negative. Okay, now this makes the process difficult because I have a combination of positive and negative bit and it's not immediately obvious how to handle those okay how do i combine so this is a negative bit suppose that bit is one this is a negative bit that's that bit is also one but suppose the other three bits are zeros happen to be zeros then I have negative 1 in this column, negative 1, 0, 0, 0. The sum is negative 2, and I'm not equipped to represent negative values. So I want to get rid of those negative values and replace them with positive values in a way that it preserves the summation of the partial product. Bowen Woolley propose this method, and the method is known as the Bauli method. Uh, it's the Bauli method and also modified Bauli method, which is slightly simpler. Bau and Woolley originally proposed this method. This modified Bauli was recognized later, which is simpler, as I said. So, okay, so remember that we have negative A4X0 there. Bauli suggests that get rid of that negative sign, <coughs> but instead, <coughs> excuse me, instead put a4 x0 bar over there. So instead of using an AND gate, which is for unsigned number, the AND gate that forms this term complement one input to the AND gate. Similarly for this AND gate, for this AND gate, for this, and for these four. So these particular AND gates, one input is complemented. However, that's not com exactly equivalent to what we had before. In order to make them equivalent, Alan Woolley suggests, and I'll justify this in a minute, we have to add A4, the bit A4 to this column, and also bit X4 
to that column. A4 and X4. Add A4 bar and X4 bar to this column and a 1 to this column. And their claim is that if you do this and you add these bits as positive bits as we have been doing all along, you get the correct two's complement product. Modified Bao and Wooly basically is slightly different in that instead of complementing one input to this AND gate, we complement the output. In other words, we use NAND. So again, Bao and Wooly suggests that if you use a NAND gate here, NAND, 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 so eight of the AND gates are replaced by NAND gates. Then you can make the scheme equivalent to the original one by inserting a one in this column and a one in this column. Now before justifying why these transformations preserve the numerical value, let's see the difference between the two schemes. In particular, note why modified Bao and Wooly scheme is preferable. In this scheme, the height of the matrix, which was originally 5, increases to 7. So more generally, the maximum height of the matrix is increased by 2. And this potentially can reduce the speed of reduction. In fact, it does in this example. Because if you have 5 things to reduce in one column, three levels of carry save addition are enough. Sorry, four levels, uh, which is the same as for six. But once you go beyond six to seven, you need an extra level of carry save addition. OK, so it basically increases the delay compared to unsigned multiplication. Whereas modified Baum and Wooly does not increase this maximum height, it keeps it at 5. The one that is added is slightly to the left of the center in a column whose height was 4, so this one also becomes 5. Therefore, the speed of reduction is not affected. So that's why this scheme is preferred. Okay, so let's now justify why this transformation makes sense. So remember that we had minus A4X0 in this column. Okay? So minus, uh, basically, then an AND expression. So let's go to the next slides where this part is blown up so that we can see more readily what's going on. So this is the bao -Woolley method, part C. And this is modified bao -Woolley, part D. And this one, one input to the eight AND gates is complemented. In this case, the output of the AND gate is complemented. OK, so let's now try to establish why these transformations preserve the numerical value. Minus A4x0, the term that we had in this column originally, is A4 times 1 minus x0 minus A4, because the A4s cancel out, and then I'm left with minus A4x0. Okay? But 1 minus x0 is x0 bar or x0 prime, because if x0 is 0, 1 minus x0 is 1. If x0 is 1, 1 minus x0 is 0. So that's basically complementation. So that explains where this a4 x0 bar came from. So this term, minus a4 x0, is replaced by a4 x0 bar minus a4. So remember that I have a minus a4 in this column. And this one. will be a0 bar x4 and then minus x4. So I have a minus a4 and minus x4 in this column. Again, I don't want to have negative values. So what I do, I say, OK, 
minus a4 in this column can be replaced by positive a4 and then negative a4 in the next column. So this is basically 2a4 minus 2a4 plus a4, which is as if I had minus a4. So basically in this column, I got rid of everything that was negative by introducing a4x0 bar and a4. Similarly for x4. Now what happens in this column? I have minus a4 coming from this column. I have minus x4 coming from this column. And then I have a4 and x4 coming from the transformations for these two. So those basically cancel each other out. And it's easy to verify that everything in these intermediate columns cancels out. And then at the end, I'm left with minus a4 here, minus x4 here. A minus a4 I can replace with 1 minus a4 with adding 1. And then I add a 1 to this one. And then the, the two ones added correspond to, I have to put a negative 1 in this column. But I replace that negative 1 with a positive 1 and I carry out. Remember in 2's complement addition, the carry that goes out of the final position is just ignored. So negative 1 and 1 in the last position are the same. Okay, so that justifies the bow woolly method. By these changes in some of the gates and adding a few terms to the partial products uh, matrix, I convert the problem of addition to just a regular unsigned addition. And I don't need to worry about sign extension. In modified bound woolly, similarly, negative a4x0 is replaced by this expression. 1 minus a4x0 minus 1. Again, the two ones cancel out. 1 and negative 1 cancel out. And I have minus a4x0 as desired. 1 minus a4x0 is a4x0 bar, NAND, minus 1. So I put a minus 1 here and another minus 1. The two minus 1s become a minus 1 in the next column. So I remove them and put a minus 1 here. And that minus 1, I put a 1 and a minus one, and then again, things cancel out in all the intermediate columns until I get to the last column where there's a one. Okay, so this uh, modified Bowley scheme keeps the height of the matrix constant, fewer terms are introduced, therefore it's simpler to implement. Okay, I'm going to skip this slide that presents alternate views of the Bowley, another explanation for why the scheme works, and I leave it up to you to study it. You don't have to because we already justified the method. Okay, the next uh, topic is uh, partial tree and truncated multipliers. What is a partial tree multiplier? As I mentioned, it's a CSA tree that combines not all of the partial product, but a subset, a batch of edge inputs. And then you have to iterate through that tree multiple times to process all the partial products. OK, in fact, we will see by the end of this lecture that this is not the best way to implement this particular multiplier because this uh, partial CSA3 still can have a large depth. And then if you iterate through it four times, you pay that latency of this tree four times. And therefore, you, you know, the design can be quite slow. I will show you uh, near the end of the lecture how you can organize this design so that the clock rate 
the rate at which you can input these batches of input can be more than what is possible with this naive design. Okay, truncated multipliers are desirable for applications that can tolerate some error. So we trade off some complexity in the multiplier for some error. Okay, lower complexity but more error. And these multipliers are easier to introduce in terms of fractional operands. Now fractional operands are fixed point numbers, so there's no significant difference multiplying them than integers. But it's easier to explain this in this way. So let's take this 8-bit fractional number multiplied by this 8-bit fractional number. So this is the radix point at the very left. And a unit in this position is called unit in least position, or ULP, is worth 2 to the minus 8 in this example. Okay, so the positions are 2 to the mi minus 1, 2 to the minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, minus 5, minus 6, minus 7, minus 8, 2 to the minus 8. So one ULP, one unit in least position, is 2 to the minus 8. Okay, when I multiply these two numbers, these are the partial products. And you notice that the shift is to the right because when I multiply these two bits, each of which is worth one half, is a one half position, generates this bit in the one fourth position. Okay, when I multiply uh, the bit in to the minus one position, to the bit in 2 to the minus 2 position, I get this bit, and then these two multiplied gives me this bit. Okay, so these partial products are correctly shifted to the right. And then when I add these partial products, I get a 16-bit value, which makes sense. If you multiply two 8-bit fractions, the result, the exact product, will be a 16-bit fraction. This is like in decimal. If I say 0.2 times 0.3, I get 0 0.06. Each of the original fractions was one decimal digit. Uh, the product of 0.2 times 0.3 is 0 0.06, which has two decimal digits. Now, frequently when we deal with 8-bit numbers in signal processing applications, all the numbers we deal with are 8 bits wide. So we may be interested to find the product with 8 bits of precision. In other words, at the end of this process, we have to get rid of these extra 8 bits to the right. Okay, by simply using the values of these bits, if we have less than one half ULP here, we just truncate. If we have one half ULP or more, we round up, we adjust these bits. So the idea here is that it is rather wasteful to do all this work, combining all these dots to the right of this dash line to get these bits and then eventually get rid of those bits, perhaps changing this. Of course, the effect of these bits on the final product is not only in this final rounding, but also as we do the combining, when we add these dots, carries will be produced and will affect this column. So several columns here may be affected as a result of adding these. But let's see what happens if I just drop all these bits that you see to the right of the dashed vertical line, not bother to form them, and not bother to process them. What is the maximum error that I commit? Well, it's easy to analyze. There are eight dots in this column. In the worst case, all eight dots there will be ones. So 8 times 1 half ULP, because this column 
I designated this column as ULP. This is one half ULP. This is one fourth ULP, one eight. So eight times one half ULP plus seven times one fourth ULP plus six times one eight ULP. If you add all of these, you get about seven ULP. So if I don't bother to form these bits, thereby saving quite a bit in the hardware implementation of my multiplier. In the worst case, I commit seven ULP errors, error. And the mean error will be a quarter of that because each of these dots is one with probability one fourth because it's the logical end of two bits. And if the bits are randomly distributed, then each bit is one with probability, each of these bits is one with probability one fourth. So the mean error is about two ULP. Okay, two ULP corresponds to this position. So I lose some precision. Instead of my result being accurate to this last position, the error corresponds to it. And if the error happens to be seven ULP, the worst case, that's roughly equivalent to a bit in this position. That's eight, eight ULP. Okay, so I lose some precision, but I save in terms of hardware. Some signal processing applications are tolerant to these small errors, and therefore we can save uh, the cost of our multipliers by using these truncated multipliers. Now, in fact, we can do somewhat better. So this was a naive uh, scheme of just dropping those bits and not, not worrying about them. So on the left here, you see a scheme where I provide a compensation of one unit in order to reduce the maximum error. Okay, how does this reduce the maximum error? Remember, in the previous scheme, when I dropped all of these, the error was always uh, negative. In other words, uh, I always reduced the value of the number by up to seven ULP. Okay, so if I provide a one here, what happens is that if all these bits that I dropped are zeros, then I have four units of error here, four ULP error because I've added the added one. If all of these bits happen to be ones, then I'm dropping seven ULP and adding four. And therefore the error in this case will range from plus plus four ULP to roughly negative three ULP. So the maximum error magnitude is reduced from seven to four. And besides it's somewhat symmetric. And symmetric errors tend to cancel each other out in the course of long computation. So it's better to have symmetric errors because asymmetric errors tend to add up and cause major uh, problems. Okay, so that's called constant compensation. Okay, uh, what you see on the right is a variable compensation scheme. And these schemes have been studied uh, in great detail. There are many papers that propose various ways of compensating for errors. The variable compensation method shown here as an example, put the first bit of x, x minus one, the first bit after the radix point, and the first bit of y here. The reasoning being that this compensation, if both of these bits are ones, compensation of two units in this column is the same as one unit in that column. If these two bits are ones, then there will be plenty of ones in this matrix. So it makes sense to compensate more. If these two bits are zeros, then there will be more zeros in this part, and therefore it makes sense to compensate less 
Okay, so the compensation we provide is variable depending on the operands. Again, this is just a simple example. You can do, uh, you know, uh, things in much more, uh, in finer, you know, gr gradations and so that the compensation is truly uh, appropriate for different values of X and Y. I leave it up to you to find the max error in that case. Remember, the max error is no longer 4. Because if these two bits are 1s, there will be a bunch of 1s here. Okay. Okay, so I leave it up to you to do that analysis. Now, array multipliers, you can view them as tree multipliers in which the carry save adder tree is one sided. Normally, we try to make this carry save adder tree balanced so that the number of levels is minimized. Here, we make the carry save adder tree completely unbalanced by making it one sided. And instead of using a fast adder at the bottom, we use a carry ripple carry ripple or ripple carry adder. So this seems rather insane. I'm increasing the latency of my tree to the maximum possible for a tree. I'm increasing the latency of my adder to the maximum possible for an adder. Why is this even a good idea? Okay, it turns out if you lay this out in terms of a circuit, you get a very regular circuit. So basically, uh, squeeze this design from the side so that the CSAs basically are, sit on top of one another. So you get a square design. This is the ripple carry adder at the bottom. And those are the four carry save adders that you see here. Inputs A1, X1, A0, X1, these come from outside. So there's still some wiring that is used to direct the inputs to the appropriate cells. But the connections between the cells themselves are very regular and they use short wires. So a cell is connected to the next cell down, a pretty short wire, and the next cell diagonally in this direction. So wiring does not consume a lot of space except for the inputs that need to go there. And I'll tell you how that is handled in a minute. So this leads to a fairly efficient VLSI implementation. So that's why we are attracted to uh, array multipliers. They have regular structures and fairly short wires between cells. Now, the critical path in this array multiplier is pretty long because you can see easily that it goes from up here diagonally to here, and then horizontally to here. So roughly K cells and K cells, the so 2K. So the latency is linear in K, whereas in tree multipliers, uh, the high-speed tree multipliers, the latency is logarithmic, okay? So this is not good. Latency is linear, but as I said, the other advantages of regularity and also ease of pipelining. So how would you pipeline this if you want to do many multiplications? You basically insert latches between rows of this design. So input comes in. As soon as it is processed by the first row and moves to the second row, a new pair of inputs can come in. And therefore, several multiplications can be proceeding at once within this pipeline. Okay, I'll show you the detailed design of a pipeline array multiplier 
uh, in a few slides. But one idea that has been tried is as long as these connections, so notice that these diagonal paths correspond to various positions in the final product. So this is position 0. Position 1 corresponds to this diagonal. Position 2, position 3. So this is basically I've taken the dot product matrix, partial product matrix, and sort of turned it a little bit. So these dots, instead of being vertically aligned in this middle column, are now diagonally aligned. So basically, bits that move in this column all have the same worth. So one idea is instead of this bit going to this cell, I can send it to this cell. And that doesn't change the final outcome. Uh, the output of this cell, instead of going diagonally to this one, I send it two cells down. And this reduces the length of the critical path because now the worst case path goes through here, through here, it skips some of those cells. So it's reduced a little bit. But generally speaking, this trade-off is not worthwhile because in doing this, I basically destroyed the regularity and short wiring. I now have longer wires, and the design is no longer very regular. So it's usually not worthwhile to do this. Now this same diagram uh, depicts another idea, and that's what if the numbers, instead of being unsigned numbers, are two complement numbers? Well, I can apply the bao woolley method to turn this into a two's complement array multiplier. Remember in the original bao woolley method, in this column, I had to insert A4 and X4. So I extend that column by one cell in order to accommodate F4 and X4. That also increases the width of this ripple carry adder, so increases the delay. And then in this column, I had to add A4 bar, X4 bar, so I need an extra cell. And then in this column, I had to add one. Go back and examine the bell woolly method. There were A4 and A4. A4 and X4 in this column, A4 bar and X4 bar in this column, and 1 in this column. So by adding just three cells, the gray ones in this diagram, I can convert this array multiplier to a two's complement array multiplier. Of course, that a little bit messes up the regularity. It's no longer a square, but has these you know, parts that are sort of sticking out, but it's still a pretty good design. OK. Now, in fact, one of the end of chapter problems asks you to do the same thing for the modified Bowoolie. And if you do that, you will see that the modified Bowoolie array multiplier is actually simpler than the one shown here. Now, this is how we actually implement an array multiplier. Now, going back to this design, you know, so inputs to these cells, these are basically full adders. They have three inputs, the sum output, which goes diagonally to stay in the same column, and the carry goes vertically to the next diagonal column, okay? So this, this is full added. So the implication here is that the, the, there are AND gates outside these cells that form A1x1, A1x2, and all the other terms. And those AND gates are outside, and then we root their outputs here. That's inconvenient. So it's easier if we put those AND gates inside these cells and then broadcast A0, A1, A2, A3, A4 to the columns, and broadcast X0, X1, X2, and so on to the rows, 
so that A0 and X0 meet in this cell. And when they meet, they're ended together and form one input to the full adder. So the AND gate here computes A0, X0. The AND gate here computes A1, X0, and so on. So all those ANDs are done within these cells. Now this is much more regular. Okay, if I want, I can replace these, these cells at the bottom. They're full adders. There are no AND gates. They don't need any AND gates, but I can use the same cells for these as well, just, you know, not use the AND gate. And in fact, I can add a cell over here to, to make this a fairly regular array of identical cells. Okay, so this is basically modified full adder cells that contain, uh, contain that uh, extra gate in order to make the array multiplier very regular. Okay, now this slide I'm gonna skip. It's a design that is interesting and rather ingenious that avoids the use of a final carry propagate adder. Because remember, in whether you do array multiplier, you need this final carry propagate adder. And if you do other tree multipliers, you still need the final carry propagate adder. This design avoids that by sort of pre-computing what the high order bits will be conditional upon the carry that will eventually emerge from here. So that when you have this carry, you already have one of these two will be selected. So the delay of the final adder is avoided, but then you have this fairly irregular structure on the side. So if you are interested, read it. And if you don't understand, I'll be happy to um, explain it to you. But uh, you're not required to do that. OK, so this is the idea of a pipeline tree multiplier on this slide. As I said, as I mentioned before, it's not a good idea to feed back in a partial tree multiplier this carry save partial product all the way up to the beginning of this tree so that we have the full latency of that tree in the next iteration. It's a better idea to decompose this tree into two parts, this top part and then the bottom two levels and then feed back this carry save result only two CSA levels up rather than all the way to the beginning of this tree. So why does this work? So basically what, what I do, I pipeline this part of the tree. Let's say I divide it into four stages so that each of these stages has the same latency, comparable latency to this part. So the iteration takes place here. Now batches of partial products come in. They move through pipeline stages. So let's say I have eight batches that are coming in. The first batch comes, moves here, moves here, moves here. The second batch comes here. So by the time the first batch is here, the second batch is waiting here, the third batch, the fourth batch, and a new batch is coming in. Okay, so this first batch is added. Initially, these two registers contain zero. And then once this addition takes place, the next batch arrives and addition takes place. So the latency of this pipeline partial tree multiplier consists of iterations that I need, but each iteration is rather fast. Instead of being many CSA levels, it's just two CSA levels. So if I have eight batches, I need eight iterations here. And then the latency of this pipeline is, say, four clock ticks. So four clock ticks plus eight clock ticks, 12 clock ticks. 
rather than 8 here. But now the clock ticks are much shorter because within each of those clock ticks, much less needs to happen, only two CSA levels. Okay, so this is the way to design a pipeline partial tree multiplier. You don't feed back the uh, carry save uh, partial product all the way up, but you feed it back to the middle of this tree, not middle actually, near the end of the tree, so that these iterations are much faster. Okay, so this is a pipelined array multiplier. Uh, I'm assuming that these uh, modified full adder cells have latches at their outputs. So there are latches down here that are not shown. So A comes in and x0 comes in, x0 is multiplied by a and added. The result moves to the second row, which needs x1. So x1 is delayed by one unit, so that it arrives at the second row at the same time as the latched output of that row. And then when the values move to the second row, another multiplication can start. Okay, x1, x2, x3, x4 are latched here, are stored here, so that the next x comes in and the next a comes in. So I can have as many multiplications in progress as there are rows. And notice that the final ripple carry adder also is arranged as four rows, so that each each clock cycle needs to accommodate one full adder delay, either there or here. But I need a whole lot of latches to basically store the inputs that need to go to subsequent lines and also store the outputs that are generated earlier so that this particular output is generated after the first row. It is kept here, kept here, kept here, kept here and then kept here, kept here, and then it emerges along with all the other bits of the product at the output. Now this would be the fastest pipelined array multiplier. I could trade off thumb latency for simplicity by putting latches after every two rows. So there will be latches here after row two, latches here after row 4, latches here, and so on. So that would require fewer latches, but then the clock cycle uh, would be uh, wider. Okay, so if I were to do a three-stage pipeline here, given that I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six, seven, eight, nine full adder levels on the critical path. I can insert the latches after three. So these dashed orange lines are the positions of the pipeline latches. So I don't need all these other latches just at this interface. Okay, that concludes our discussion of tree and array multipliers. In the next lecture, we will deal with chapter 12, basically lumps together all the other topics about multiplications, various other types of multipliers, and the special case of squaring. Because you can do squaring using a multiplier and tying both inputs to the same number. But it turns out that the squarers are simpler. You can design simpler circuits to square a number. You don't have to use a multiplier. Okay. So the, that's it for today. Bye until the next lecture.